So, and the, the, this picture, in case you're wondering, is of our new computing and data science building at BU that is almost finished right now. So I think I talked to some of you who are from uh, the Boston area that you, you might have seen it. Um, it sort of dominates the Charles River landscape on our side of the river. All right. So um, I'm going to start just by kind of very high level, at the high level talking about what is machine learning and what are neural networks. But then I'm going to get very quickly into my specific area of research, um, which is broadly speaking, I'm sure you're all aware of the amazing success of artificial intelligence, uh, especially in the last, you know, I would say 10 years or so. Um, Here's one example of what AI can do, which is generate natural images of people's faces. These are people who don't exist. Um, this is just uh, a neural network dreaming off a face. Um, this person doesn't actually exist in the real world. And you can see the progress that we've made even from a couple of years ago in 2015, the quality we were getting compared to, this is already old, that update, we're getting even better quality than this now. Another uh, big success that you might have heard of is in games uh, and solving games even that have traditionally been thought of very difficult for machines and for AI, right? So we started kind of, you know, we solved chess a while ago and then we were, okay, poker is going to be the hard one. Um, now poker is more or less solved by AI. And uh, this is an example of another game called Go, um, which is like a very complicated game of checkers, but that's not really giving it uh, due credit, but it's, you know, something that human experts train their whole life to be a good Go player. And now we have AI that can basically beat some of the world's best Go players. And then, of course, the other very commonplace by now application uh, and success of AI is in language technology. So things like speech recognition, we probably don't even think twice about using that on our phones for speech recognition, for machine translation, um, even, even some assistive um, applications now like chatbots. So um, in general AI, uh, we think of this as um, algorithms that help us automate tasks that humans either don't want to do or are not very efficient at doing these tasks. Um, but generally something that in the past had only been done by humans. Um, so if you think about, let's say, um, recognizing uh, objects and images, and this talk will in general be very focused on images and image understanding as kind of the application area because that's primarily what I'm doing in my research, but um, you know, there's also uh, language applications and many others. So in this task that a human can do, and you can see um, on the right, it's actually a human doing the task. It, they're providing the correct labels. Uh, we're, we're labeling every pixel in the image based on its semantic category. So the red pixels are all human beings. Uh, the dark sort of purplish color is the road. Bright pink is the sidewalk, blue is cars, and so on. All right, so this is a task that uh, machines had not previously been able to do, but now uh, we're actually getting to the point where machines are getting quite good at this. And of course, we can use this, for example, for self driving cars, um, which was mentioned earlier, actually. Uh, I think Cynthia mentioned this. So um, that's one application, and we have a project on this. We also have another project also um, assigning a label for each pixel in the image. But in this case, the image is coming from a, um, we'll see if you can guess what this is. Any guesses? Sorry, Chris. Recycling, very good. So this is actually footage from a recycling facility in Massachusetts. And um, the goal is for the machine to be able to assign a label of cate the category of the material. Is it plastic, soft plastic, hard plastic, paper, metal, and so on. Now, so I'll mention this in more detail uh, at the end of my talk. So in many of these cases, the task that we want to add, automate is maybe boring or hard, or just in this case, dirty. And in the case of uh, recycling, it's just a dirty and dull job. 
Um, so uh, let me just at a very high level, again, this has already been uh, mentioned a few times today. And so this will be very brief. What is machine learning? Right, so actually machine learning is what powers AI. Um, in general, it's a software algorithm that learns to make decisions from examples. And we talk about having a training stage uh, versus a testing stage. So in the training stage of machine learning, we are given a whole data set of examples. So here we're training our algorithm to classify handwritten images of digits into digit categories. So this would be a classification task because the output is a discrete label between zero and nine. And so in training, um, the predictive algorithm takes as input the data, in this case, an image and outputs the label. So um, it learns to do this properly. So this is the training or learning process where in the, in the beginning, the algorithm will make mistakes, right? So it will make incorrect predictions uh, because it's, uh, let's say its parameters are initialized randomly and it's not very good yet. But then through the process of correcting its mistakes, eventually it learns to make good predictions. And this is called minimizing the loss or minimizing the error, right? So in this case, the error is how many examples are not classified correctly in our training data, right? So by minimizing this error, uh, is how we learn, how we how we uh, tune the parameters of our predictive algorithm. So once we train our algorithm, we then take that algorithm with all the parameters that it learned and use it for testing. So the testing stage is when we get new inputs that are previously unseen. So these are the test data that were not part of our training data. And uh, we use it as input, and then the, the, the goal is for the algorithm to just make predictions on, the, on these new unseen examples. Okay, and this what you've seen earlier with the, the earlier lectures, you know, there's a whole theory behind how this is done. I'm not going to go into that theory, um, uh, but I just want to give this high level overview again. So when we talk about deep learning, uh, what we mean is that the predictive algorithm is a neural network, right? So this is a very popular type of algorithm. Um, in fact, deep learning just means neural network uh, architectures that have many layers. Um, and I'll, I'll show briefly what I, what I mean by that. Uh, but essentially a type of neural network um, that by now I think has come to mean many layers, so the depth is high, and also it's just a large uh, model in terms of having many, many parameters, many cases, hundreds of millions of parameters. Um, so, right, so the, the, the predictive algorithm is the uh, neural network, um, and then we also have to train it on a data set of examples. And the distinguishing characteristic of a neural net is that it learns so-called features which are patterns in the data. I'll, I'll talk about what I mean by that. Um, instead of relying on hand-coded features. So in images, this, this is important because unlike, let's say the medical example that Cynthia was giving earlier, in some sense, the features uh, already given to us, like a patient's blood pressure, for example, or their sex or their um, history of diseases they've had. So, uh, we already have those very informative features. In images, we just have pixels that have grayscale values between zero and 255, and there are millions of them in an image. So we don't have any descriptive, uh, meaningful features. And so the power of neural nets is that they're able to learn these features automatically. Um, neural nets are inspired loosely by neurons in the brain, um, which are, of course, cells that process chemical and electrical signals and transmit these signals in the brain. Um, so this is, a, a, I would say, a loose, loosely inspired by the brain, um, although there's quite a bit of work trying to compare um, how neural nets behave, automatic neural nets behave, and um, biological um, neural networks behave. And so uh, we can sort of think of uh, an artificial neural network as a kind of artificial brain, again, very loosely speaking, it doesn't actually mimic what happens in the brain all that closely, but at a high level, we can think of it that way, where um, the input is encoded, 
as this first layer of neurons. So here, each circle is a neuron, but at the input level, it just contains the data, right? So it would be the value of each pixel in the image. So we would stack the image as a vector, and each um, node here is the value of, that, of, of the pixel responding. Um, and then um, we have the next layer and the next layer and so on. And so these layers are all connected in this forward fashion. And in the end, we have the output layer, which uh, would contain the same number of nodes as we did output. So if we only want to classify dog versus cat, we would have two nodes, one predicting the probability that the input image is a dog, and the other one predicting the probability that the image is a cat. Right, so at the high level, artificial neural networks consist of many interconnected neurons that are organized in layers. Um, neurons receive, each neuron receives input, multiple inputs from the neurons in the previous layer and passes its output to the next layer. And what each neuron does is just a very simple function that takes a weighted combination of its inputs and then applies a nonlinear activation function, say a sigmoid, and that's it. So it's a pretty simple computation. But by chaining many, many of these computations together, we get a highly nonlinear function that we're able to learn with this neural network. Um, and so we can think of this uh, sort of artificial brain, uh, maybe, you know, uh, we talk about neurons activating, right? So this means that a particular neuron, its output uh, from the nonlinear activation function um, is above some threshold. So let's say it's closer to one than zero, right? So that this means that that neuron, um, after computing the weighted combination of inputs, had a high, let's say, high positive value, which then got converted to something close to one. So um, we talk about this being active. And it's sort of maybe similar to how uh, neurons in the brain, the human brain might light up on an MRI. Uh, but again, this is just um, kind of uh, more of an analogy than anything else. Um, but basically, this is one way that we can think of um, these individual nodes kind of preferring certain inputs over others. And this is how they're learning patterns. Okay, so let's come back to this learning patterns business. So again, as I said, a neural network has layers. The first layer is the input layer. It just has the, let's say the pixel values, or this could be, um, this could be a vector representing a word if we're talking about language, but here let's say it's the pixel values of the image, and then uh, a bunch of layers that are connected, and then the output layer, which makes the final prediction. <laughs> So let's say that we have, well, let's pick this one neuron. So this is our first uh, really hidden layer. That's not the input layer. And let's say this neuron, um, if we run, we train the network, and then we take this neuron and we find all the cases in our training data set where this neuron was active, right? So it means it produced a high value close to one as opposed to a low value close to zero. Okay, so um, typically, um, images are first split into patches before being fed into a neural network. So in reality, what we would do is we would see in all the training image patches, which ones led to this neuron uh, be active, being active, right? So let's say this patch is one of the patches in the training set that activated this neuron. And then we collect all of these patches and we just compute the average patch, right? So we take all of the patches for which that neuron was active and we average them together and we get something like this, right? So this is one way to visualize kind of what um, that neuron is learning, right? Because this is already after training. This is what that neuron has learned to pick out from the input data. Um, and then if we do this for all the neurons in our first layer of this network, we'll see that they all learn something a little bit different, but more or less they're learning essentially to detect edges, oriented edges, vertical edges, horizontal, diagonal edges. Um, some of them are just learning to kind of detect, uh, you know, white uh, patches, maybe dark patches and so on. Okay, any questions so far? 
Um, so just to be sure, so are you saying that in the input layer, it's taken just one section of the pixel that has like the RGB values, for example. So if there are, in this particular picture, there are maybe three by three, like nine different pixel values, it's going to have nine different circles in the input layer. Is that like how it works? Ah, uh, yeah, good question. So um, let's think of this input layer as being a small patch of the image. Um, in, in, in reality, we would have um, an architecture that processes all the patches, but let's just simplify it and say the input is just a patch. Yeah, then let's say the patch is three by three and it's grayscale. So there are only nine pixel values in that patch. Then we would have nine uh, nodes there, each one corresponding to the pixel value. Yeah. And then the number of hidden, um, hidden layer neurons, we call them hidden because we don't know what they are. We have to learn them. Those are the, the nodes from which we're learning the parameters, which are the weights. Right? So the strength of the weights, uh, which are shown with these lines here, are the parameters we're learning. Um, and so there's always a question in neural networks. How do you design them? How many layers they should have? How many nodes they should have per layer? This is a design choice. Um, it's actually not a whole lot of theory. There's a little bit of theory, but not a whole lot of theory that guides you know, how to design these networks. Um, yeah, so any other questions? So, so actually, we've just visualized the average patches that activate our neurons in the first layer. But um, as we go deeper into the network, and again, just imagine that our network will actually see the entire image and not just a single patch. Um, in say in layer two, if we visualize similarly, now they're bigger patches. Um, and what the network is learning there is some sort of part representation. So if this is the data set of faces, we see that it's going to learn let's say an eye feature, left eye, right eye, eyebrow, nose, chin, lip, and so on. So parts of an image. And then as we go even deeper in the network, um, again, because the inputs to the deeper layers are the outputs of the shallower layers, the previous layer, um, they sort of learn uh, to aggregate those patterns into more complex patterns as we get deeper into the network. So we'll see even whole objects like faces emerging uh, for, for uh, neurons in the later hidden layers. So this leads us to say that neural networks learn hierarchical features. Question? So like in the second uh, part of the image labeled combination of edges. So you're going to a neuron in the second layer, the second hidden layer, and then are you tracing are you taking averages over all of the patches in the hit in the original layer that lead to that or what? Um, yeah, so the hidden the the second hidden layer. So I'm actually I'm abusing this station a bit. I'm showing you a fully connected network, but this visualization is for a convolutional network. Okay. Um, so the second layer will have seen larger input patches, and that's what I'm visualizing. Here. Okay, all right. Yeah. So it's a bit of a simplification. Okay, so right, so we, we say the neural networks need hierarchical features, and that's what I mean by talking about representation learning. So learning a representation of the data in terms of these implicit features is what neural networks are good at, is what deep learning is good at. Um, because now let's say if our overall task is to, let's say, uh, do face recognition, um, uh, we would, um, you know, want the output layer to predict, let's say, if, you know, this face is person A or person B. Um, its input is the previous layer features, which are a lot more semantic. They're actually picking out certain types of faces from that image and not just kind of, is the second pixel bright or dark, right? So they're learning a useful, in this case, the network is learning a useful representation for that task. Um, and that's the key, really, is that because the feature representation is learned from data, it's able to learn some features that are actually helpful for the task. And sometimes they even learn features that a human being wouldn't use. Um, 
And this is one of the reasons that neural nets, you know, there's a lot of uh, research now in, in interpretability of neural nets, kind of understanding what it is, the, what the heck are they actually learning? Uh, because these features are not always going to be intuitive to a human being. Okay, so uh, for the rest of the talk, this is the outline. I probably won't get through everything. Um, I was ambitious, but um, first I'll talk about data set bias and, and how we deal with it uh, and some, some results from my lab. Um, then I'll talk about um, trash. <laughs> Yay, trash. Um, and then if I have time, I'll talk about learning from language. Okay, so let's get to this data set bias issue. So of course we know that AI makes mistakes, right? Despite all the hype, we you, you guys have probably seen something like this, right? Hey, what's up? Hi there, Katie. I'm not Katie. I'm not sure I understand. You called me Katie and my name is not Katie. You're certainly entitled to that opinion, Katie. <laughs> Uh, but on a more serious note, um, this is an example of AI uh, failing at a much higher rate. So these numbers are accuracies in um, gender classification, but broken down into um, based on um, the person's uh, skin color and gender, right? So you can see here that um, the best, the highest accuracy is on lighter skinned males. The worst accuracy is on darker skinned females. So this is a quite concerning kind of failure of AI, um, particularly because it's not fair across the different uh, populations, right? So it's, uh, in this case, the AI is failing at a higher rates for certain populations than others. And then an even more um, severe problem and actually quite a sad uh, case is this case of a self-driving vehicle that um, was being tested and, uh, in Arizona and was um, being driven by AI, eventually. It did not recognize the bicyclist that was crossing the road. Unfortunately, the person died. Um, this was a very tragic, you know, kind of, of course, there was a, a person who was supposed to be taking over you know how in self-driving cars you're not really self-driving um you're supposed to keep your hands on the wheel and the person fell asleep or something i'm not sure um but these are the kinds of mistakes that ai you know when when ai makes these mistakes we really care um, we really don't want them to happen okay so what is data set bias so some of these issues um, are coming uh, from data set bias. And this is this issue of data sets being finite, essentially. Um, so suppose that you're, you've trained your computer vision system um, using data that you collected from a car um, where you labeled a bunch of images, let's say in California, and you labeled uh, all the pedestrians and all the bicyclists. But now you want to drive it around New England. Uh, you want your model to work well in New England, but the distribution of the input data is changing now, right? So unlike California and New England, we have snow, rain, uh, people wear heavy coats, right? So basically because of this mismatch in the training and test data, the model is going to fail. It's going to miss a bunch of these pedestrians. Uh, and actually, in this uh, example of the self-driving car hitting the, bi the bicyclist, you know, one of the reasons they think is because um, the model wasn't trained on a lot of bicyclists that are crossing the road. Right? Usually, the bicyclist would be, would be either on the road or on the sidewalk. Um, so, so we call this uh, issue of mismatch of data set bias, or sometimes we call it domain shift. And it's essentially this problem that your training data, like you know, the sunny California data, is not like what you see in test time, let's say from um, old New England. Okay, so when does data set bias happen in the real world, in real life applications? Well, it happens all the time in many ways. So one of these is uh, when your training data is from one city, but your target test data is from another, or Maybe your training data came from the web, but your target testing domain is on a, on a robot in some environment in the home. 
Or uh, maybe you, you, and this happens a lot in robotics, you train on simulated data, but at test time you get real data. And as I already mentioned, it could be because your training data and your target test data have mismatched demographics. Um, or even cultural shift, right? So the idea of what a, a wedding is in one culture could be very different from what a wedding is in another culture. So when I started looking at this problem a long time ago, um, I was surprised by the drop in performance that we get. So here we trained a classifier of objects um, on some web data and it worked great on that web data domain. So again, we have separate, a separate test set that we are testing it on in the web domain, getting about 90% accuracy. But then as soon as we test on this target domain data from a mobile robot, we have a, a, a huge drop in accuracy, right? So this is an issue, for example, in robotics. Like if you uh, want to train your computer vision model to pick up certain objects um, and put them in boxes or something like that, um, you have to deal with a shift uh, in the in the data distribution that comes from different lighting conditions, different facilities, and so on. Another example is ImageNet. So I don't know if you've heard of this very large scale data set of images and with their labels. Um, it has up to twenty two thousand labels, different categories. You know, cats, dogs, everything. But um, in this experiment from a couple of years ago, what they did was they um, collected a new test set, which actually, oops, they collected the same way that the original image that was collected, you know, about 10 years ago. Um, they just repeated that data collection. So it's, it's collected from the web and then you give it to annotators to assign labels to it. Um, and so if you look at the images, you know, they're actually, they look to the human eye to be quite similar in terms of the data distribution. And yet, when they train on the original ImageNet training data and test on this new test set of ImageNet, they see a very large, this is huge. This, this is a very large drop in performance. So this data set bias can even have happen when you, you know, you think, oh, I'm going to get the same data distribution collecting at the same time but it can still happen. And this is still kind of an unsolved problem in fact. So why does data set bias affect machine learning or deep learning in particular? Well, it's because our training data sets are biased in some way. And this is just because they're, they're finite, right? Uh, there's no way that you can fully IID sample the whole world, or at least I would argue, and, and I'm, I welcome debate on this, but I think it's really hard. Um, and so, because let's say our training data for a neural network for face recognition is mostly adult faces that will learn these features that I told you about. And then let's say we test it on kids' faces. Well, it hasn't seen a lot of kids, so it hasn't learned a lot of features that fit child faces. Like children have larger eyes and bigger heads. And so it's not gonna be a good match in terms of features that it learns. Right, so and similarly, you know, if our training data set is mostly white faces and then at test time we have, let's say, Michelle Obama, again, the features that are learned are not going to be the best match for the input domain. So all of this leads to poor accuracy. Um, and how we can solve this issue? Well, obviously, we can just collect more data, right? Um, but the problem with collecting more data is it's often just very expensive. Um, and you know, it's very expensive. Sometimes uh, you don't even have time to collect more data. You wanna be able to adapt very quickly. Um, you don't have time to take your production, you know, system out of production to retrain it every time. The other issue is long tail distribution of labels. So there are a lot more dogs in the world than there are, um, I don't know, um, snakes like because they hide right <laughs> just pulling that off the top of my head or like one issue we see um with self-driving is there are very few people in wheelchairs or, or or people with canes that are walking um so you have all of these problems that you it's just hard to get enough data but ideally we want to have a learning-based solution that um just 
doesn't, uh, doesn't require us to collect and label more data. Okay, so um, let's first define our problem more formally. All right, so we have a source domain with lots of labeled data where data is x, i, y, i. Here, x is our input, say the image, y is our output, let's say it's a label. And we have n different labels. And um, the source domain uh, data comes from this just distribution ds, whereas the target domain comes from a new distribution dt, which is somehow different from the source distribution, as you can see here. And uh, in this case, we're going to assume that we have access to target unlabeled data. So Z, J are the inputs in the target domain. Say we collected some images from our target domain, but we don't have any labels for them. And our goal is going to be to learn a classifier H that achieves a low expected loss or equivalently high accuracy under the target distribution ET. All right, so this is going to be actually my only math slide for the rest of the talk. Um, there, is a, there are some theorems um, and there is some theory for uh, learning to deal with domain shift, distribution shift. This is one of them. Um, so this is a theorem uh, that says that the target error, so uh, this is the error on the target domain of hypothesis H, their classifier H, right? So we're interested in bounding the error on the target domain. Um, and so the theorem says that this, is, this error is bounded by, first of all, the error that H achieves on the source domain, that's our training domain, plus uh, D1 of DSDT, this is, a measure of the divergence between the distributions of the source and the target data. Plus uh, this term, which is basically um, the difference between the labeling functions in the source and target. So this allows for some, um, some difference in how inputs are labeled in the source and target, but we expect this to be small. Okay, so we expect this term to be small. We also expect the first term to be small because that's our supervised learning objective is to minimize the source error, right? So when we're training the hypothesis, we are minimizing that first term, the error on the source domain. So the problem is the second term, right? So the second term is the divergence. And the way it's defined here in this theorem is as a divergence between two distributions. Um, so you see, you see how it's defined down here. So here B is the set of measurable subsets under two distributions. And then you take uh, basically the supremum of their differences, um, their distribution. So it's, it's one measure of divergence, but they're less important what the specific definition is. Um, essentially, the problem is that the two distributions are different, and this contributes to the, um, the bound on the error. Right? So the larger the, the difference between the source and target distribution, um, the less uh, we're able to bound our error. So like the higher the error is expected to be, although this is a bound, a theoretical bound, doesn't mean that it actually happens in practice. But at least this is some theory. Okay, any questions? Um, what's the script of B for the soup? Yeah, I think this is one. B is a set of measurable subsets, so it's part of all, all possible um, sets. But E sub S and E sub T, that's just like the the source distribution and then the target distribution. That's right. Yeah, that's just the distribution. D S is a distribution over source uh, data and D T is distribution over target data. Okay. So let's look back to pictures because I like pictures. Um, 
let's look at why this difference in distribution is a problem again. So let's say we have our source data with labels and we're, we're, we've trained a neural network. So this is our network uh, abstracted. There are a bunch of layers in it. And then we just take the uh, last layer before the classifier layer. So remember that last, the last layer of the network is what predicts the class label. Uh, we're just going to take a look at the layer before that, and we're going to plot it. Let's pretend that it's two-dimensional because I don't know how to visualize uh, very high-dimensional data. Um, so let's pretend it's two-dimensional. So um, they're basically, let's say, two features. And if we plot them, we see that the network learned to separate the two classes, backpack and chair, pretty well in the training data set. Um, but now let's say, right, and then there's, we can also visualize the classifier as a decision boundary in this feature space. But now let's try, let's take some new target data. Let's say this is coming from a mobile robot as opposed to web data. And now we take that same network and feed the data forward. And then again, plot each data point in this feature space that the network learned, we see that it's um, distributed differently from the source data distribution. Okay, so, so the problem, of course, as you can see here pictorially, is that this decision boundary, which was very good for the source distribution, is no longer very good for the target distribution because of that shift, right? So we have these um, examples here that are going to get misclassified by the classifier. That's trained on the source data. Okay. So, so this is an issue caused by partially this uh, change in the distribution. So, how can we fix it? Right. So, how can we fix this problem that our two feature distributions are different? Um, and again, this is one of the issues before I get to the solution. One of the issues, and this is actually a visualization of a, an actual data set. So here, the blue points are all the training points. I think the data set is uh, images of different, um, different digits. And so you can see that the training points, this is extracted from the network that was trained on the blue points. And then we also extract features on the red target domain. Uh, where the images are different. I think they're coming from um, house numbers as opposed to handwritten digits. So there's a shift in the image domain. You can see like pictorially that they're very different distributions. But if you look at this closely, you might see another issue, which is the blue points are clustered, right? So the model learned a feature representation that clusters the blue points, so it's discriminative. So essentially each of these clusters is gonna be one category. But on the red points, it's not very discriminative. So this is that problem I was alluding to earlier. So like if our training data um, doesn't match the target test data, the features that are learned on the training data will not discriminate the, the target data very well, like the adult faces versus kids faces that I mentioned earlier, right? So in this case, because the, the, tar the target data is coming from street numbers, uh, the network just didn't learn to be, uh, to have uh, features that are discriminated for those kinds of images. So uh, both problems are an issue, but let's, let's just go back to this distributional problem. Um, so number one, the idea number one is gonna be, can we fix this by essentially learning to align the two distributions, right? So without uh, requiring any labels on the target, can we learn to align, play it again, the source and target uh, distributions? So, and here I'm plotting the target features with essentially labels, but in reality, we don't have labels. I'm just plotting them with labels to demonstrate how they're ground truth labels because they're going to be uh, misclassified, but in reality, they, these are just points with no labels. So the idea um, behind 
this first solution, and this is um, you know something that we came up with a while ago now, uh, or five years ago. So it's a little bit uh, out of date, but it's I think it's interesting because a lot of follow-up methods use this as a uh, kind of one of the components. So the idea is to align the two distributions. And to do that, we need a loss, which is not using labels on the target domain, right? So how can we do that? Well, maybe if we had some way to define a loss that said the two distributions are different, we could minimize that loss, right? So that's essentially the idea here. Um, and in this particular um, paper, we're doing adversarial alignment, which means that our loss is going to be given by an adversary network. Okay, so what I mean by that is we add another network here, or really a couple of layers, but it could be, it could also be a full-fledged network. And so this network is going to get points uh, from both source and, and target distributions. And it's going to try to predict which distributions each point is coming from. Is it a source point or a target point? So this is our adversary. Okay, so we train this for a little while and then we stop and then we go back and we optimize the network, which is, this is actually the same network. Um, I just copied it twice. We, add, we optimize the network parameters in such a way that now this discriminator is not going to do well on this task of discriminating the source and target distribution. So it's an adversarial setup, right? The discriminator tries to distinguish source from target points, and then the feature encoder network tries to confuse the, the discriminator. And so if we alternate between updating the parameters of the discriminator and the parameters of the encoder network. And in the end, the hope is that this aligns the two. Any questions? So this loss um, that we use, this adversarial loss, it's a min-max loss. So we're like we're minimizing um, our uh, parameters and we're also trying to maximize the discriminator's loss. And this is the same kind of loss that's used in GANs. If you've seen images generated by GANs, the same idea. It's just that here we're not generating images. Um, we're trying to align the feature distributions. Okay. Question. Can I just say again what to mean by aligning distributions? Um, yeah, so what I mean by aligning distributions is reducing the discrepancy between the two distributions. So um, the way we measure the distance between two distributions really depends on which algorithm we use, right? But you can think of different ways of measuring distances between distributions. Like, let's say the simplest way is just to uh, compare the mean and, and standard deviation or mean and covariance of, like, assume the Gaussian distribution, right? That's the simplest way. So in that case, if we are trying to minimize um, the distance between the means and covariances, then that's how we define aligning the distribution. So if the mean is the same and the covariance is the same, we've aligned them, right? So it's, it's uh, up to the definition of that difference uh, or, or divergence function. So in that case, you would um, change this uh, new, new uh, to actually have a different mean and a different value. Right, right. So uh, in this case, we're not uh, using mean and covariance right, yeah, but, distance, right. but if, if we were, um, we, would, we would be updating the network parameters such that the mean and covariance of the features it generates is the same in the source and the target. Okay. So I guess, I think you might've just answered my question, but when I see domain alignment, I'm thinking about learning to change the images so that they match the other images. But I'm guessing what you really are saying is that the network outputs are aligned. Exactly, but I, we can also do that, what you just mentioned actually. 
But yes, in this case, it's the network, it's the penultimate layer of the network. So the, the feature layer, I mean, we could also do it on all the layers, but just for simplicity here, we're just doing it on the output of the second to last layer of the neural network. So if I go back, maybe where I had my, yeah. So this one here, I don't know if you see my mouse, the second to last layer. So the last layer is the output layer, the last hidden layer essentially, yeah. So that's just a vector of numbers, right? So we are, we can plot them, we can look world, we can plot them in 2D anyway, and we can um, measure their distributions and differences in their distributions, so. But yeah, so you have a, a good point. Here, we're doing this in feature space. Um, and one of the downsides of doing it in feature space is, this can sort of fail um, quietly, and we may not know that it failed. So like, for example, this could be some catastrophic alignment where a bunch of the wrong class points got aligned to the wrong class. Um, because again, the target points have no labels. So we're just sort of hoping that the, there's enough structure in the domain so that the, once the distributions get closer, they, um, the classifier um, works well and everything is aligned nicely, but it doesn't always work that way. So, uh, but nonetheless, it can work. So this is an example, again, of that non-adapted, so the original feature space that I showed you of the two digit domains, blue is the source and red is the target distribution. And then after doing this kind of adversarial training, um, you can see that the blue and red points have become much better aligned together. The distributions are now more or less overlapping. Yeah. I was wondering how come the blue points change their um, position if we were just aligning the um, unseen targets so many data. I would, right. see, I would expect that the, the yeah. red ones would move over. There. Yeah, that's a very good question. So actually, we also, uh, we update both, well, it's a single network that's extracting both the source and the target points. And we train it actually with both losses. Um, so the classifier loss and this GAN loss, this adversarial loss, because if we don't train it, if we, if we don't include the classifier loss, um, it can completely diverge and learn something crazy. I'll like put everything into one point because that satisfies the, you know, the domain, uh, domain alignment loss. So yeah, it's trained with both losses and it's the same network. So um, that's why the, the source feature distribution is also changing. But that means that it can affect the performance, right? Like the performance of the original blue point might have been yes. slightly better than after the... Yes, that's right, you can. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and actually it's important to learn the right hyperparameter that trades off how much you optimize the source Label loss versus this alignment loss between the source and target. I was just trying to understand the domain alignment, and I understand the feature space for the target. Like the target is being like sort of made closer to the feature space for the source. Are there like properties on like how say the label distribution is shifted and how it sort of relates to? Whether say there is like a catastrophic like case that you mentioned, like this property. So in the alignment, I wasn't sure like where the label distribution of the target was like part of the. Yeah, there is no. So here we're assuming that we don't have any labels on the target. So it's actually hard to know if there's catastrophic alignment or not. But one way that you can measure it is just by taking that network and measuring its um, error on the source again. Because if it's really, if something catastrophic happened and it just kind of over-optimized the alignment at the expense of good discriminability, then you'll see that on the source data. Uh, but, there's, but there's other ways of measuring it also on the unlabeled data. And I have some recent work on that, but it's, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Maybe, is there a last question? Okay. Um, all right, let's see, let me move on to the second idea, which is, um, that I think someone over here, you mentioned, right? So actually, why not do this in pixel space, in the, in the input data space? 
So we can actually do that by, instead of aligning the feature distributions that the network is outputting, we can stick another network here, which translates our source data into um, images that look like the target domain. So here, it's the same idea, and this is a more probably, uh, if you've heard of GANs, probably more what you've heard of what GANs do. They actually learn um, how to generate images. Um, but really, they're learning, they're just learning to generate points from some distribution, right? That's what a GAN is. It's learning to mimic some, some distribution. So in this case, this network is a conditional GAN because it takes an input image from the source domain and generates a version of it which looks like it came from the target domain. So it's trying to sample from the target data, but conditional on an image from the source domain. And so the idea here is like, if we are able to do that, then we can just you know, train our network directly on this translated source data, which looks like target data already. And so it shouldn't have a domain shift, or at least it's reduced. But there's still probably a domain shift because as you can see, you know, um, the generated images are not perfect. Um, they have some artifacts, but the idea is that hopefully the domain shift will be smaller. And so the classifier train on this data will um, not experience a drop in accuracy on that target data. So we call this pixel space domain alignment. And um, let's look at some results. Uh, let's see if this actually works. Um, so first of all, how do we measure how we measure out of domain performance, right? So you've probably seen in the earlier lectures, the kind of chapter and verse of machine learning is we have IID data. Take some data set, we sample some training data from that, and then IID, we sample a test set. And so they come, always come from the same distribution. Uh, but in the real world, as I hope I've convinced you by now, we often don't have IID data, test set, we have out of domain data, right? And the problem with IID testing, which is very uh, standard in the machine learning literature, is that the vast majority of data sets have IID test sets. And so when people report their latest and greatest model and its results, they're always testing it on IID test data. And so they're always overestimating how well that model generalizes. So the solution, I think, is to always have some out of distribution data that you're testing on as well. And actually, to this uh, point, in my lab, we've been collecting data sets like this for images, right? So we have collected progressively larger and larger data sets with more domains where uh, for each label, we have images not just from one domain, but also other domains. So like, um, this domain net data set is largest collected. It has six different domains um, and about 360 classes like airplane clock, ball, and so on. And so for each label, we have samples from six domains, which are sketch, real images, quick draw images, uh, paintings, uh, infographs, and flip art. So uh, the idea is that you can train now, you can train your model in one of these domains and test how well it generalizes to the others. Um, there are other data sets that have recently been proposed. So there's a wilds and an extension of wilds, uh, which has uh, also multiple domains and not only for images. So there are some image domains, but also some um, molecular graph data, uh, some uh, text data like online comments and product reviews, uh, but also from different domains. Okay, so let's see if this works. Um, and I'll probably wrap up in about five minutes. Is that okay? Um, so this is an experiment where we train on the data set shown on the top and then we test on the data set shown on the bottom. So if we train and test, this is the MNIST data set, quite famous, just digits. Train and test on this data set, the network is great, 99% accuracy. 
If we train on this SEHN data set, which is street view house numbers and test on MNIST, we have terrible performance, which kind of maybe is expected. But what's not maybe expected is these last two shifts from USBS to MNIST. So to the human eye, these look like very similar data, right? But the drop in performance is almost the same. So if we apply this um, domain alignment that I mentioned, and then we test the resulting model, we see improvements across the board. So accuracy goes up the most for this shift, these two shifts, which are smaller shifts and less so for this SVHN and MNIST shift. So the takeaway that um, this technique can improve accuracy on target data, even though we don't have any labels on target data. So you can also think of it as some kind of unsupervised fine tuning method or unsupervised and supervised learning together. And then here's a target uh, harder problem. So here our source data is synthetic data. This is actually different objects that are generated using uh, 3D models and using graphics. And so we want to train our model to classify these objects on the synthetic data set and then adapt it to real photos. So this might be useful in, let's say, uh, robotics, where we can only train, let's say, like we want an arm to manipulate objects, and it's hard to train it in the real world. So we might want to train it in simulation. Uh, but then visual inputs will be simulated. So there'll be a big gap. But on top of that, we also make it even harder by introducing missing categories. And turns out that plain, uh, the alignment that I talked about, this technique of domain alignment, actually starts to break down in this case because it tries to align the entire distributions together. But if some of the classes are missing from the target distribution, that's going to be bad. So, uh, so we actually had to propose some other techniques to deal with that, uh, which are mentioned in this paper, um, if you're interested. But essentially, after we do that, we do still see an improvement in this case. Um, so the best competing method for domain adaptation was getting about 59% accuracy. We're getting about 73% accuracy on this uh, data set. So you can um, apply kind of these techniques to achieve some pretty good improvement in many cases. Um, and then in, in uh, maybe the last one that I'll show and then I'll stop um, is this, and I guess I'm not going to get to language, but that's okay. Uh, oh, maybe I'll get to trash a little bit, just quickly. Um, so this um, image level alignment. So here we have uh, target domain is a real data that you see kind of the grayish images. Uh, and we're translating it into our source domain, which is coming from a game. So I don't know if you've heard of Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> it's like this game where you can do things that you really shouldn't be able to do. Um, so this was, uh, the model was trained to translate from the real world data into the Grand Theft Auto kind of data that you can see is like brighter colors and kind of weird growth textures. Um, and then if we apply it uh, to test images from the real world, we see that without adaptation, due to the large domain gap, we have pretty bad segmentation outputs. But after adaptation, they improve. Um, still not great. So I wouldn't say this problem is solved. Um, but it's also a pretty hard shift, right? So between simulated data from Grand Theft Auto to the real world data. Um, there's more results that I'll skip. Maybe I'll just um, I'll go quickly to we'll go to all the slides. I want to talk about trash. I don't want to leave. I know you guys all want lunch. Me too. Um, so this is a real world problem. Uh, where we actually have a lot of difficulty collecting labeled data. So I think it's a good test case. Um, recycling, big problem. Uh, in, in the United States, we only recycle 30% of all recyclable waste. And uh, we don't even know where to put it now. Other countries don't want to take it anymore. 
it's a dull, dirty, and dangerous job. So uh, some of it is uh, sorted by machines, but a lot of it is sorted by human workers. And so we collected a data set from a, a recycling facility in Massachusetts, and a, a later another one in Vermont. So this project is led by my graduate student, Dina. And so compared to the previous, um, there are some existing data sets for uh, recycling, uh, computer vision for recycling, but ours is a lot more um, industrial grade and more realistic. Right, so this is the actually the data we have, and we label it with bounding boxes and segmentations uh, for all of the uh, different kinds of recyclables of so paper, plastic, and so on. Um, you can see some more examples here. It's a hard problem for computer vision and semantics mutation models because the objects are very deformable. Um, and uh, kind of where they are in the image is not very, very useful information, which is unlike existing data sets. Um, like, for example, in existing real image data sets, you can, even if you don't see the object, you can probably predict what it is just by its context. Whereas in our data set, it's very hard to predict what the object type is based on the context because they just kind of pile up everywhere. So that's the answer in case you were guessing. Um, yeah, so um, there's some other differences, but basically for this data set, we're actually running a challenge uh, at the NeurIPS conference in, that's coming up uh, in December, but the challenge is going to start pretty soon, and uh, you know, maybe some of you are interested or tell your friends. Um, so hopefully we'll see some, some submissions that push, push the state of the art on this problem. Um, okay, so I think I'll end here. Thank you very much.